starting at verse 1, and let's pray as we open. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to have our second session as a local assembly, and we pray for your word to come forth in clarity in this group tonight and for those who listen by recording. We ask this in Jesus' name. So first, uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 1, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the th- son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So we saw that there was no contradiction between what Paul did with Timothy at Lystra and what Paul did with Titus just previous to that, just previous to that at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, where Titus uh, was taken by Paul to Jerusalem so that Paul could take him into the conference uncircumcised and bring him out of the conference still uncircumcised. But there was something different that was involved in Acts chapter 16 with Timothy, and I won't uh, repeat it. You can uh, uh, look at the the, uh, audio video on our first session tonight for the details, but the upshot of it all is that this with Timothy took place during a period of transition after the official decision of the Jerusalem Council, which decided that Jewish believers were not prohibited from practicing circumcision, but Jews were prohibited from forcing Gentiles to be circumcised. So Paul defended the gospel in Jerusalem by making sure Titus went there and came out of there uncircumcised, and Paul defended the gospel in Lystra and surrounding parts by having Timothy circumcised, because it was all about the gospel, the protection of the gospel message, and causing as little offense as possible when carrying forth the gospel. You don't want to be unnecessarily offensive when you go forward with the gospel as an ambassador for Christ because the gospel message itself causes a great deal of offense. So other than the offense that the the gospel message itself will bring You don't want to extra offend people. Let's look at something about the offense of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We've been there recently. First Corinthians chapter 1. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to start at verse 18, where Paul writes, For the word of the cross, the the word translated word is logos, word or information, topic of discourse. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are 
being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Uh, He's drawing from Isaiah 29, verse 14. Verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, that is, in the sphere of God's wisdom, in the realm of God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, that is, the wisdom of the world, its own wisdom. So let's look at it again, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. In other words, it, pro- it pleased God through what the, the Greek intellectuals thought was foolish. Christ crucified the, the, the word or the information of the cross. In God's wisdom... Since the world did not know God through its own wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness, that is, the seeming foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. In Psalm 14, verse 1 and 53, verse 1, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. As I've taught recently, the fool is not rational. Thinks he is. He or she thinks he or she is very rational, very intellectual. But the fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Why has the fool said this in his heart or in his thinking? Because he has an agenda. And in fact, in Romans chapter 1, the creation in the world, the creation of plant life, of of land masses, of animal life, of human life, the organization and orderliness of it all, the creation itself testifies to the creator. And yet, that is rejected by man, and the fool in his intellectual arrogance has an agenda And the fool's agenda proclaims there is no God. You cannot reason with these people, but that's where Romans 1.16 comes in. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That is the, the very saving message of what Christ accomplished on the cross, for it is the power of salvation. And let's move on to verse 22. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. Why a stumbling block to the Jews? Because they're religious people trying to establish their own righteousness before God through their own works a stumbling block to the Jews, and a folly to the Gentiles, verse 23. Why a folly to the Gentiles? Because of their intellectual arrogance. Verse 24, 
but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the, and there's some hyperbole used, some intended exaggeration, as if God had any foolishness. Of course, he does not. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God, as if God had any weakness, is stronger than men. And the the supposed weakness of God was demonstrated through the weakness of God the Son taking on the form of humanity and making himself vulnerable to everything humanity is and enduring great suffering from man and emptying himself in Philippians 2 uh, to be obedient and being equal with God, uh, he forsook or forfeited the privileges of his deity, emptying himself, becoming obedient to God, even to the death of the cross, taking on the form of humanity and therefore making himself vulnerable to everything human beings are vulnerable to, plus facing the absolute hostility of the cosmic system. As he stood out in contrast during his human life with the cosmic system. Absolute contrast with the cosmic system. Not conforming in any way to this age or this world as he's called us to do the same. Not, with, not without relapses, but but we are called to, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto him and to, to not be conformed to this age, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and that coming through the renewal that Bible doctrine gives to the mind. Let's go on here. I, I got a little sidetracked. Uh, verse 26, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The offense of the cross is that Christ had to pay our penalty on the cross with a horrific sacrifice as he was punished by God the Father for all of our sins during a period of three hours. Christ had to accomplish a horrifying sacrifice on the cross in order for us to be saved. And that is an offense to us human beings or to we human beings who want to 
work our way into God's favor through personal merits, through religious effort, or through uh, doing good deeds. And yet the Bible tells us that by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So, in verse 29, that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The offense of the cross is that Christ did it all and that we can add nothing to it from ourselves. No effort, no merit, no goodness, no work. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So God has made it very easy. By grace you are saved through faith. Belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved? Acts 6.30. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31. To as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the children of God, even to those who believed on his name. You see, faith in Christ is the opposite of attempting to work for your salvation. Faith in Christ is placing your trust in another. Billy Graham used to say, I, I'm not a good man, but there was a, a man who was good for me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn, please, to John chapter 3, the Gospel of John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're running short on our second session so, uh, of time, so we're not going to get as far as I wanted to get. But nevertheless, we will cover some ground. The offense of the cross... It's incredible because it is through the cross that God demonstrated his love. God demonstrates, present tense, Romans 5, 8, his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only 
Son of God. Now that makes it very clear that whoever does not believe is condemned already. This does not mean condemned forever, but is already under the condemnation of spiritual death until that person may believe. If the person believes, the person will no longer be under the condemnation of spiritual death. But verse 18 again, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed. Why is he condemned already? Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. For those who say, how can a loving God let children starve, die of cancer, and so forth and so on. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. 1 John 4, 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction of God's righteousness and justice for our sins. And the condition is very clear for salvation. Believe. The one that's condemned already, why? Because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The person who believes on him is what? Not condemned. I was just speaking with someone on the phone recently about Calvinism. Calvinism uh, in their, their distorted doctrine of five points, TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, total depravity, as the Calvinist sees it, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, all of those points are erroneous as viewed by the Calvinists. And the Calvinist says uh, in the U of Tulip, unconditional election. And unconditional election being that man's will cannot have a part of all or, or a part at all in the process of regeneration unto salvation. And yet the Bible is clear. There is a condition. The, the condition is belief. Belief on the Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The T, the first letter of TULIP, the, the Calvinistic concept of total depravity is that you cannot believe unless you are regenerated first. So the elect, those chosen ones in which their free will has nothing at all to do with whether they wind up in the lake of fire or in heaven with the Lord forever. Their, their, uh, their belief cannot occur if they are to believe until they are regenerated. And that goes directly against John 3.16 and John 3, 18, and Acts 16, 31, and Ephesians 2, verse 8, and Romans 4, verse 5, and I could go on and on. 
So the T and the U in tulip, false. You see, men study in seminaries, even even seminaries who teach dispensationalism, and they are taught that often that uh, we are modified or moderate Calvinists and that, that the points of Calvinism are, are pretty much right except for the unlimited atonement point, which uh, atonement is really not a good word for that subject, but, but their belief is uh, in their doctrine of the limited atonement uh, the Calvinistic doctrine of limited atonement teaches that Christ only paid the penalty for the elect, not for every member of the human race, not for those members of the human race who uh, are not the elect and who will wind up uh, in everlasting condemnation. And yet... The Bible says not only whoever believes in him is not condemned, but furthermore, in Acts chapter 17, and you can turn there with me, Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, and uh, I'll start at verse 30. This is, this is the Apostle Paul preaching in Athens, Acts 17, verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked. Now let's take that phrase uh, because we have to understand during, during the dispensation of the law, God overlooked the pagan activity and idolatry of the Gentiles and focused on the Jews. He did not excuse the Gentiles. The Gentiles uh, with everyone else who are unbelievers are not excused in Romans 1 verse 20 because the creation itself bears witness to the creator. Yes, bear, bears witness to the creator. So they're without excuse. Romans 1.20. But God's focus was on Israel. Now, uh, and, and Paul was, was saying basically now with this new dispensation that he was proclaiming in Athens in A.D. Uh, around A.D. 35, somewhere, or no, a uh, uh, little later than that. But, but uh, he's proclaiming in Athens. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. In other words, his focus is now on the world, and he has a message going out to all the world. That message is what Christ has accomplished on the cross for salvation. And he's called on all people everywhere to repent. Metanoeo, change your mind. Change your mind about Christ. Verse 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So, he has called on all to repent, to change the mind, Regeneration is not required before 
all mankind is called on to change the mind. There's no record where it is. And there's no record that there's nothing in the Bible that even implies in the remotest way that only those who are already regenerate can believe. And in fact, Christ did die for the sins of the whole world. Turn quickly to John chapter 1. That's where we'll close. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And verse 29, John chapter 1, verse 29. So as I've spoken and written in the past, we've, we've kicked the T out of tulip, we've kicked the U out of tulip, now let's kick the L out of tulip. John 1, verse 29, the next day he, that is John, the baptizer, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the only way the Calvinists can attempt to wiggle out of that is by saying that, well, John was talking about the world of the elect. Well, the world was never in any context other than in the context of the Calvinist mind speaking of the elect. The same with 1 John 2.2, 2, which makes it very clear. He is the propitiation for our sins. And John then uh qualifies that statement, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He is the satisfaction of God's righteousness and justice for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. 1 Timothy 2, 6. He is the ransom for all. Hebrews 2 9, he tasted death for everyone. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, we are controlled by the love of Christ, having concluded this that since one died for all, therefore all were dead or all died, you can translate it either way, but that means all died in Adam. All were in spiritual death and in need of a Savior. And that kicks the L out of tulip. And we'll deal with I and P in our first session next week. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for everything you've given us tonight. And we pray that this session of teaching and the session prior this evening, both of these sessions will be a blessing to those who will listen on the Internet and will be a blessing to us as we go on and uh fulfill our lives and the spiritual life in the day-to-day -day world. And we pray with thanksgiving in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.